Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is columnist for the Commercial Appeal, Jeff Calkins. <laughs> The set was different, the format a little different as well, and the host was Commercial Appeal columnist Jeff Calkins. It was six years ago, and it was the beginning of Sports Files. Jeff was the original host of the show, a show created to fill a large void in the Memphis community. Until that point, there was no local television show that tackled the pressing sports issues of the week. Sports Files was created to do that, but so much more. After two years, Jeff moved on, and I took the reins of the show, changing it up a bit to not only interview the movers and shakers, but also to feature some of the off-the-beaten-path sports events and athletes. Four years later, and six years after Jeff started, we have arrived to this point, and we certainly hope you have enjoyed both versions of the program. Today, the award-winning columnist from the Commercial Appeal, Jeff Calkins, joins me to talk about his career, the ever-changing newspaper industry, and of course, the pressing local sports issues of the week. And it's next on Sports Files. Jeff, it's great to have you on the show. Good to be back. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Does it, does it feel a little strange to you? Yeah, so you've redecorated a little bit. You've redecorated, <laughs> and then honestly, it's with a, it's a little bittersweet because since I when I was here last, Pierre Kimsey was still here, right, and Jim Eichner was still here, and we've lost both of them, and uh, so it's a little sad, but also nice to be back and good well, to see you. Great to have you on the program. Yep. Let's go back to when it started for you. I'm a Harvard grad, you became an attorney, not unlike my son who became an attorney and wanted to get into sports somehow because that was his passion. You got into sports, and obviously now you're a columnist and an award-winning columnist at that. Why did you make the transition? Why did you leave law? Oh, I was an unhappy lawyer. I honestly think there's a, it's funny, I was just reading a story that something like 28% of, 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 of lawyers have alcohol. I really think law can be a very difficult profession. And I was, at a, I was a lawyer at a 500 lawyer law firm in Washington, D.C. And it just wasn't, um, you know, I knew as I was doing it that I should be doing something else. And honestly, what I really have always liked is telling stories and collecting people's stories. Um, and so I said, you know, why don't we go give that a try? And so I gave it a try. And this past January was my 20th year of doing it here in Memphis. So, um, you know, I don't. Occasionally you look at the newspaper industry and wonder if you made the right choice. Right. But, um, but fundamentally it's been a kick, yeah. And I've known you now for about 20 years. We came, came basically at the same time. Did. Same time period. When, did you when, beat me? when I started in January of 96. I was November of 95. Yeah. We went on the air December 1st at, at what is now ABC 24 and CW 30 when Fox and ABC made the switch. So we've been around. R.C. Johnson for started years. basically the right, same time. Right, R.C. Right. Johnson was essentially the same time. And boy, has the sports landscape changed over the last two decades, as you know. Let me ask you this. You, you talk about some of these stories that you do and people just applaud you and they should. They're terrific. They're award winners and you get all the, the positive feedback. Then you do a story that certainly fires up people. And I would imagine texts and emails and phone calls that are negative. You seem to be thick-skinned. How do you deal with the negativity? I don't think I'm thick-skinned in the sense, and it gives me actually great sympathy for the people that, you know, who are in the arena, the Josh Passners of the world, who are constantly criticized. Because to the extent that I'm criticized, and I am, it's, it's on so much smaller scale. So mm -hmm. I can't imagine what it is like to be, people can say, yeah, he makes $2.65 million or whatever. It's still tough to be criticize that severely. I think what helps me is that, listen, if you go to the comment section of the commercial appeal, I'm getting eviscerated. If you look at the letters to the editor, you'll see some mean letters to the editor. People ask me to move out of town all the time, that kind of thing. But fundamentally, I guess I think, and I, my experience is that most people appreciate the work that I do. And that's from talking to people at the grocery store, and it's from talking to folks where I go to church, and it's from just being around and about. I get much more, um, credit 
um, and I, you know, applause or whatever else than I deserve. And it's one of the great things about your job. Most jobs don't have people who walk up to them and say, hey, I love your work a lot. I get that enough that I think it's fine if there are some people who, who, who don't like my work. You know? But if I really thought that those people were the majority, that would bother me. Right. And, um, and it's why I do understand why, why it would bother a coach. I would imagine you realize that you do wield some influence. Do you embrace that? I think embrace it. I think you have to be careful about it. Honestly, I wrote a column uh, earlier this week on the situation out at the University of Memphis, and it followed a story that Mark Parasquia did for our paper. And that paper, that column was one that I was writing for. It was going to originally run in Wednesday's paper, and I just struggled with it. And it, there were enough interlocking pieces that I didn't think I had it right. And so. I said, you know what, I'm going to stop and write again about this tomorrow morning and take another stab at it, even if it comes out a day later, because I do think that the, it's not so much that I have the influence. The person who, who has my job at the newspaper has influence. It's the columnist at the, at the newspaper. And so, um, and I like to think I have a little bit of credibility too, but fundamentally, um, there is an obligation to treat people fairly and to try to, um, to say something that's not just inflammatory. And so I don't embrace it so much as I take it seriously. I'm old school, Jeff. I still walk down to the curb where my mailbox right. is and pick up my newspaper right. every single day. Right. But we know things have changed. A lot of the times, the word you're trying to get out, people are finding it via social media. They're finding right. it via Twitter or on the internet somehow. The whole newspaper industry has changed, right? Oh, I mean, dramatically. It's um, you know, just the numbers of people at the Commercial Appeal. The, it, the funny thing is, is that people say no one reads the newspaper anymore. If, if we let if we gave away all of our stuff digitally for free, more people would probably read my column between the internet and the newspaper now than have ever read it before. Right. It's not that people right. don't read the newspaper, it's that newspapers have not come up with an economic model that allows them to make money anymore. Once upon a time, if you wanted to buy or sell a house, if you wanted to get a job, if you wanted to buy or sell a car, you had to advertise in the newspaper. That's the only way to reach people. Now, all that advertising is gone for good, and what it has done is, it's changed our job a little bit. It's also like I have covered seven Olympics and 10 Super Bowls and I've covered the Masters and, I've, and we don't do that anymore. And we don't do it because we know that we have to, A, the paper's not rolling in money anymore and B, we have to focus on Memphis things, things that only, that, that, that you know, you can read about the Olympics from anywhere, but, but we have to make ourselves unique. And so it has changed my job and I worry about not just my future, but the future of, um, you know, of, of, of intelligent conversation because newspapers have been important. And I don't think anything that has emerged necessarily yet to replace that. Here's the good thing. There's been a lot of stories to report on in Memphis concerning right. sports, especially lately. You've been very busy penning out a lot of columns on the University of Memphis. Let's start there. Uh, no, no, no surprise because the way things were going, the uproar from the people, they wanted to change. You came out, uh, you penned the calm, and you, you said it's about time. Let's make a change, or Memphis make a change. The change was not made. Right. I mean, how do you feel when, when you come out and say something you know, and it I doesn't was, work? I, I was, that column that I wrote, it was in the wake of the East Carolina game, and I sort of said, listen, it has reached a point that this is unsustainable. You know, this is just not, the, the, there comes a point where faith in a program is broken, and there's, and it's not even so much that, I think Josh should be fired. It's that if you look in the stands and see the stands half empty at best, if you uh, at, look at losses to South Florida and Tulane and East Carolina, it's, you look at the transfers away, it's just not working. Now, throughout it all, however, I do understand that in the end, $10.6 million is $10.6 million for a right. public university that it's strapped. I can make a strong moral argument that it's better to pay him, that there's, you can't, rash, can't, can't justify paying that for a coach to get away. The problem is this, though. If he's not successful this year, it's still going to be $8 million you're owing him next year. So don't look at the $10 million number. The difference is only $2 million or $2.65 million. Mm -hmm. Is that worth making a change? And I think that, if you know you're going to have to pay him the eight to go away next year, is it really worth keeping him when all you're saving is 2.65? I think that's a very interesting question, and a lot. We'll see what the reaction to the fans will be and has been to the decision for him to come back. That story is so two weeks ago. <laughs> we have so much more yes, going on. Yes, that is true. You wrote, as you mentioned earlier in the week, about the story that is concerning the contract of Josh Pastor, Tom Bowen, both at one point were represented by the same agent. 
uh, people up in arms saying, wait a minute, that, that has to be unethical, if not illegal. Uh, but you pointed out in your column that, that it's not. Um, but for the university, though, now doing an investigation on this, they certainly have egg in their face. Yeah. It, to me, listen, it was an important story. They're doing an investigation. Mark Persky revealed the fact they're doing an investigation into possible conflict of interest, interest because they had the same agent. I'll be honest, though. I don't think, and I don't think most people think, who know the situation, think that Tom Bowen gave Josh Pastor that contract because agree. they have the same mm -hmm. agent. I just don't believe it. Tom Bowen can be difficult. He can be prickly. He can be whatever. Um, but I don't know anyone who thinks he's dirty. You know, I just don't. I do think he's a man of integrity. And, and, um, and furthermore, the larger context is one where I don't even think he was the driver in that contract. It was Shirley Raines, who was president of the university at the time. Um, it was other folks. So were mistakes made, as they say, in, the, in their drafting of that contract? Yes. But the fundamental decision to pay Josh that amount of money was not Tom Bowen's. It came from above, and it was driven by the fact that USC was after Josh Pastner. The larger point, though, is that there have been a series of embarrassments for the university. The attendance questions, the, uh, the dinner for John Calipari that was scheduled and then canceled became a national headline. This is now investigation in the athletic director. How they handled uh, is, the Austin is, Nichols deal. is a national headline. The With Austin the Nichols agent. thing, they're saying we're going to, yeah. And then, and so to me, the attorney, I should say, to yeah. me, it, the question is, is, uh, and it's not even that Tom Bowen's incompetent because I don't think he is. Right. I think he's done a fun, right. fundamentally decent job is whatever the dynamic is over there between David Rudd and Tom Bowen and the coaches in the athletic department, right now seems to be producing a series of questionable uh, decisions, to say the least, and, a, and an ongoing embarrassment to the university. And for those of us who care about the university, that's not a good thing. Do you believe there's discord between Rudd and Bowen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I believe there's discord like all over the, like we asked Josh in his last press conference, does he feel supported by the university? And he would not answer the question. He went out of his way to not answer the question. So Josh doesn't feel supported. I mean, I, you don't have to say what I believe. All you have to read is Tom Bowen's quotes in the paper said, I'm being crucified. Right. <laughs> That's a man who doesn't They're feel like arrows he's at being there, shooting arrows and crucified. So we know Josh feels hung out to dry. We know Tom Bowen feels hung out to dry. Um, no, there's very clearly not happiness and smiles over there. How do you make fans excited about next season when, first of all, the roster is going to be completely right. overhauled, but we have all this disharmony going right. on inside the administration, inside the, the athletic department. They said they're going to come out and they're going to make changes. Okay, first of all, you'd have to force Josh to make those changes. Second of all, what changes are we talking about right. that could possibly appease fans for next season? Yeah. Well, ultimately, the way you make fans is the way that Memphis football has made fans. I heard you talking about Memphis football, and, um, you know, you win games. You beat Ole Miss. You like that. In the end, that's what the basketball program needs is what the football – it's funny that, to have such a – such warm feelings about that football program right now. And I, right. Th and I think there really are real enthusiasm about it. At the same time, you have this trouble with the basketball program. You know, I, I don't think it's a salvageable situation with basketball. I, I suppose if Diedrich Lawson comes back and if Avery Woodson doesn't transfer and the kid from Chicago who they recruited, the point guard, Charlie, Charlie Moore, Moore um, comes, I can make an argument that they'll have one of the th two or three best rosters in the American Athletic Conference next year and you win. Um, and then you go from there. But it is a long way back to build from as low as they've gotten I imagine a lot more people are going to bail in terms of season tickets. This year, a lot of people didn't use their season tickets. I suspect next year, a lot of people will have dropped their season tickets. So, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's hit low ebbs before. It was at a low ebb when Tick Price was here, right? And then John Calipari comes, and, and up you go. So it's the nature of things. It's just right now they're obviously struggling. One, do you believe the Big 12 will eventually be an option for the Tigers? Do you believe they'll expand? And number two, if it's something that's going to happen sooner than later, does this chaos, for a lack of a better term, hurt the university? I don't think it can help. You know, I, I can't believe it can help when you're looking over it and saying, why do you want a part of that? Like right. This, right. Um, the funny thing is, is that I don't think anyone outside of Memphis takes Memphis's candidacy for the Big 12 seriously. Mm -hmm. You don't hear anybody, national media, anyone talk about Memphis. They might throw them in at the bottom of a list of eight right. schools, right. whatever. I really do get the sense, at least at the university, that there is more confidence that they are at least in the mix than is reflected at all in the national media. I do believe that they, and I give them credit for this. I think 
under R.C. Johnson, I don't think they were doing enough to get into a Power Five conference. I do believe that they're doing everything they can behind the scenes to get in. I don't have any sense of whether that will be productive or not. It would clearly be transformative to the university because ultimately, if you don't get in, ultimately everything's going to suffer. Football program's going right. to suffer. You cannot, right. in the end, you will not be able to keep up. Because Ole Miss, for example, gets a check before they sell a ticket, before anything else happens, they get a check from the SEC for $30 million. And the University of Memphis gets a check for $1 or $2 million. And you can't, you can't compete in anything if that's the skewed reality. Only have a couple of minutes, but I wanted to get your thoughts on the wacky season it is for the Grizzlies. A record setting 27 different players have played right. in a game, yet they're still, they're, they're hemorrhaging, but they're still headed, it looks like, to the postseason. How do you describe this season? You know, I think it's been its own kind of odd fun. Very clearly, the postseason expectations are not what they <laughs> odd fun. I love it. Aren't what they will have been. And, right. I, and honestly, like I think there's real concern, the real over Marcus All going forward. Like that's a real problem going forward. But setting those things aside, you just have to appreciate. And to me, I've said this all along. I don't think sports is about winning championships because so few do. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because I'm from Buffalo and the Bills never have and the Sabres never have. I've never known what it's like to have a champion. I, Memphis Tigers, though, have never won a championship in basketball. But has it been fun? Yes. The key is moments along the way, right? And so when you have moments along the way that the Grizzlies have given us, even this year, the win over the Cavs when no one thought they could win, the wrestling night win when no one thought they could win, they came in, the Clippers come into town, and they beat the Clippers um, with a bunch of ragtag group of players who largely many of us had never even heard of before. So I think you just have to seize the pleasures as they come along. And it's been a different kind of pleasure, not what anyone would have wanted, but it's been kind of fun. I mean, it does have that bad news bears quality, and you can even <laughs> see Dave Yeager embrace it in a way. You know, he is, I think it's Dave Yeager has been at his, his best in sort of, in, in, in making this group sort of find success within, the, within all the chaos. So it's been curious, but the Grizzlies have been fun for six years in a row now, and they continue to be. Different type of fun now, Different as you kind. said, ragtag. Yep. Uh, yes or no answer, Dave Yeager back as head coach next season? Yes, but I think there's a real chance that that's a 60-40. I think there's a real chance it could be voluntary if he left. It would be because he wanted to leave and they would not hold him back. I don't think he'll be canned by any stretch of the word. But could I imagine that he might say, please let me go to Minnesota or somewhere? Mm -hmm. I can imagine that. And it'll be one of the things that'll be interesting to watch this summer. All right. You're usually on this side of the, uh, the table or of an interview yeah. doing the interviews. I'm doing the interview today. You're off the hot seat. Mm -hmm. but we like to wrap up all our interviews with our guests with something we call Five for the Road. Okay. Quick answer. Okay. I'll easy try to questions. be quick. I'll try to be quick. And I know you're from Buffalo, yes. so Go I know ahead. where this yes. may be headed. Favorite professional team, sports team? Probably now, eh, we'll say the Bills. Bills. Bills and Sabres. But Bill, Bills, Bills is it 1A, 1B? Just because they're bigger. Right now I follow more Sabres because there's more hope for the okay. Sabres. But Bills, Bills' favorite team ever. Favorite pro athlete of all time? You know, I'm going to say, my, growing up, it was Gilbert Perot, who was a Buffalo Sabre, who most people have never heard French of. French Connection. Was French Connection, all mm -hmm. that. You know, Zebo and, and, and Shane Battier are, are, are among my, my top two now. Wow, so it's all right to have a, a favorite player so. that someone no, I'm, covers? Yeah, I, I think he's, I have, I have a different kind. It's not the adulation. Right. I have immense respect, respect. for Shane. Yeah. And honestly, I have great respect for what, for, what Jack, for what Zach Randolph has done. But in terms of a kid, Gilbert Perot is probably my guy. I'd say Simpson, but he murdered people. <laughs> He was my favorite guy. <laughs> he was. He's off, he's I had to list. eliminate him. All right, real quick. Favorite music or musician? I'm, so, I'm, I'm an old. I'm like a James Taylor. So, JT? Yeah, James Taylor. The other JT? James Taylor. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, favorite movie of all time? You see, I'm such a sap. This is going to ruin me. I, you know, I, I like, uh, like, I'm, I like, I like the sound of music. Like, that's me. I'm like that. I'm not, you know, I like Die Hard and I like all those. But really, like, I like the sound of music. Go ahead, sue me. All right. Sue me. We'll take it. I should say The Godfather to be cool, but honestly, <laughs> give me that moment when Christopher Plummer starts singing Edelweiss because he hears music back in his house, and then they go across the mountain. Cool is usually the rule. It doesn't have yeah, to be cool in this case. Yeah, cool is not my rule. Favorite TV show, 20 seconds. I got. I don't really want. I, yeah, I'm kind of nothing. Uh, Got to be sports files. Got to be sports files. The old incarnation and the new one too. Jeff, thank, thank you, you so much. I appreciate it's it. It's been an absolute Sorry pleasure. I failed. That's commercial Bill columnist Jeff Calkins. We'll take a break. Overtime is next.
In the South, there are many who believe the second most popular sport next to college football is, well, spring football. Spring games draw tens of thousands of fans, and it's not just schools from the South, Bama, Texas, Michigan, Ohio State, the list goes on. The list, however, does not include the University of Memphis. It never has. But that could be changing. No, the Tigers will never draw tens of thousands for a spring game, but football at the U of M is on the rise. And who knows what will happen in the future, especially if the school can get an invite into a Power Five conference, most notably the Big 12, which is the most likely to expand. But even if that doesn't happen, Tigers football is now something that people are very interested in. And that's thanks in part to the last few seasons under head coach Justin Fuente, who is now the head coach at Virginia Tech. Earlier this week, the Tigers opened up spring practice under new head coach Mike Norvell. And while there's no way to look into a crystal ball to see how the program will fare, the hope is the Tigers will continue to prosper and grow under the new regime. And before practice got underway, Mike Norvell and members of his coaching staff met the media to talk about their expectations this spring. Uh, we're, we're all chomping at the bit. You know, this is something we've been looking forward to since uh, we got back here in January. And, you know, we got through recruiting and uh, we've had, a, had an opportunity to get out there and you know, be around the guys through the morning workouts. And, uh, but we haven't had helmets, we haven't had footballs. And so uh, really to put it all together, we're, we're, we're excited about uh, getting out there and working with each other. Uh, I tell you, Coach Storms has done an unbelievable job with the training of our guys. That's one of the reasons we're starting a little bit later, uh, not just for, you know, kind of the implementation of the, the schemes, but really just giving our guys an opportunity to, to, to build their bodies. And when you look at the numbers and you see some of these guys when they run out there uh, uh, tomorrow, some of the physical changes we've had on this football team is, is something I'm, I'm extremely excited about. And uh, you know, these guys have worked. They've been putting in their time. You can tell they're hungry, and, uh, and everybody's looking to make a good uh, first impression. The guy that we've had le leading this football team for the last three years was a special player. He's a guy that he's going to be. He's going to hear his name called very early in the NFL draft, and uh, uh, so we know we got some big shoes to fill. But uh, the guys we have competing, I, I've been really pleased with what I've seen from them. Um, here so far this spring, you know, tomorrow is when it counts. I mean, you every day that we get out there and have an opportunity to work uh, with each other, it's, it's going to, uh, you know, kind of get uh, give them a chance to, to show what they're uh, uh, what they're looking to do with their opportunity. And so um, you know, we're excited about them. We got three talented young men. We got another one coming here, uh, um, you know, when our when our young guys report in August. So uh, I don't know if we'll see a uh, unless somebody does something pretty remarkable and takes a job here this spring. Uh, we know this competition is going to to go probably through the summer and uh, into fall camp, but uh, we're, we're excited to see what this group's going to do. Right now, our guys are still very new to the terminology, and so we know there's going to be, and just like anything, there's going to be some mistakes. There's going to be some, uh, some uncertainty there early, but uh, but we're going to go out there and establish the way that we're going to practice. Uh, we're going to establish a, a, a finish mentality. You know, that's something we talk to our guys a lot about. Is uh, we, you know, we want to finish what we start, and so that starts in practice. Um, you know, we've got to we've got to really uh, work for that as a, as a, as a unit, uh, you know, offense, defense, and special teams, but then that's got to be the heartbeat of our, of our team. Um, and so you know, we're looking to you know, really get a sense of being able to introduce our schemes. Uh, you know, but I don't want to get into spring where it's to see who's going to win, offense, defense, and just spend all of our time on scheme. I want to see who's getting better fundamentally. I want to see the guys, uh, each one of our position players, you know, getting developed to be the, to getting developed uh, to be the best players that they can be, preparing themselves for what they're going to do this fall. I'm excited to be here, to be a part of the Memphis staff. Uh, the kids right now have had some success over the past two years. And right now we're just looking to continue to keep the success going. We got some kids that's, uh, you know, carry themselves with a chip on their shoulders and they want to make Memphis a, a program that's relevant across the nation. They're putting in the work to, to, to make it happen. And we as coaches are grateful to, to be here and to be a part of it. It's been a roller coaster. We'd like to try to be in that conference championship race year in and year out. And I think we've been in it two years in a row. Um, we have to continue to do that, which means replace good players with good players, to continue building on the formula that has been laid here, the, the foundation, but also adjust to the new things that Coach Norvell wants to do 
to continue that, build on it, and be even better. Like I said when I got here, uh, there, there's been a culture of winning that's been established. And uh, you know, our, our goal is to continue to, uh, to grow and build off that. You know, we, you know, we want to take the next step as a program. And uh, uh, you know, it's going to take everybody involved. It's going to take all the coaches, all the players. Um, you know, we all have to get on the same page of what the expectations are. I mean, I think last year uh, you know, this football team kind of got a glimpse of, of greatness, really. And uh, you saw the excitement and uh, uh, what it meant to this community, to this university. Uh, uh, this, everybody's excited about Memphis football. Now it's our time to go and continue to build off of that. It's our time to go, you know, you know show everyone what the, uh, what the 2016 football team is going to look like and you know, what we're going to be all about. The Grizzlies' regular season is winding down, and this will be a busy week at FedEx Forum as the Grizz host the Spurs Monday, the Nuggets Wednesday, and the Raptors on Friday. The team signed veteran guard Jordan Farmar earlier in the week, and he would become the 27th player used by the Grizzlies this season. Right now, the Grizz remain in the fifth spot in the Western Conference. And that'll do it for now. Have yourselves a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.